So this session is uh, titled uh, Perspectives from Recipients of Care During COVID-19 Pandemic. I um, hope everyone can see the screen. Um, yes, it's not in, I know the, for those of you with OCD like me a little bit, um, it's not in full screen mode because of many other issues in terms of displays and also managing the, the webinar functions. But I think the screen it should be big enough for you to be able to see the, the slides. If anyone's having issues, please let us know in the chat. So we'll be using the chat for more informal discussions and introductions of yourselves. Um, my name is Solange Batiste. I'm the executive director of ITPC. Um, you are part of a um, webinar now for the Sequin project on, for differentiated service delivery hosted by ICAP and the International AIDS Society and their initiative on differentiated service delivery. Um, we'll be using the Q&A box for um, questions throughout the session. We have a tight uh, time schedule, so I'm just going to move forward and as we go through, we'll introduce people. Um, if you are looking for web archives of previous ones, we had on the 31st, the 7th of April, and the 14th of April, and this week we're here. This is the, these slides will be shared with you on the um, Sequin website, and this is where you can find the archived webinars. Um, CSA every Tuesday. So for the housekeeping bits, as I said already, we're using the Q&A section. Um, we're using the chat box. Remember to click all panelists and attendees, otherwise you'll just be speaking to the panelists in the chat. And in the Q&A section, all of our panelists will try to answer. Panelists just means one of the persons presenting and those that have those access. Okay, so quickly into today's agenda, um, I will give some small opening remarks and I'll hand over to Bhaktan Kilingo, who is the treatment education lead at ITPC, and he'll set the context for um, these perspectives and then we'll hear from the meat of the session today from three country perspectives Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire and Uganda in that order and then we'll hopefully have time for one round of discussion that will be facilitated by uh, Bactrin Kalingo and then we'll close up and give our thank yous. So quickly moving into the session now um, there's been a discussion about you know uh, what are governments going to do and the trade-offs and the difficult decisions that they have to make. And we speak quite broadly about the, you know, lockdowns. And so we try to unpack lock lockdown for, for our purposes. And it moves from these, you know, no restrictions where you just encourage physical distancing in terms of policy directives coming from the government to shutdowns where, you know, there, you know, schools are shut down and you can't meet in big groups, but it's not as strict. Um, then there are time-based curfews and other examples um, like that. Uh, some are different countries have different times. And then there are those specific to travel constraints, intra-regional travel, so you can travel within certain areas, and then intra-region travel curtailment as well. So these restrictions come by geography. And then you have lockdowns, which are partial and uh, and can also be full and different countries have taken very different approaches to this and we're looking uh, the sequent countries and we'll go through some of those. Um, the point here is really to think about balancing the economic impact with the public health and social impact and each thing comes with a trade-off and has to be tailored based on the country. Um, so this is some of the things I'd like to, to, for you to keep in mind as we frame the discussion today. Um, here are examples of pictures um, of people on the right doing proper social distancing by the markers. And yet on the other side, we have um, people lining up pretty much on top of each other before they let into the compound. So we reinforce again the, the, quest, the problem of policy directors sort of given off on high and then a very different reality on the ground. And so where it's really critical to hear these perspectives. Um, so this is a mapping of sequent country, by sequent country, the official policy directives, um, whether it's a full lockdown or partial lockdown. And we have the 14 countries on the right-hand side here by their flags. Um, and then the start date and the end date. This is a living document and thank you to the IAS for also helping to, to support and get this information in. Um, and and uh, ICAP as well through sequin. Um, but we know that some of this needs to be updated and may not be fully accurate as of today because things are changing um, by the minute, it seems. So everyone has declared a state of emergency and recipients of care are technically allowed to travel to get their medicines. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, yes, within lockdown areas. Um, but we'll hear about the realities of that on the ground in terms of being able to travel. 
And then does a specific HIV COVID-19 policy exist? Not just a COVID-19 policy or some sort of clinical protocol, but does an HIV COVID-19 policy exist? And the question I think will be interesting to ask and to hear from our um, panelists today um, would be our community, were communities engaged in the development of, of this policy? Um, I'm going to hand over now to um, Dr. Bactron Kilenko, who's our treatment co-lead at ITPC, who will talk about um, a summary of the answers to some questions we asked to all of the recipients of care in the community uh, uh, practice, community of practice at Sequin. Bactron? Thank you. Thank you, Solange. Um, bonjour, hello, good morning, good night. Wherever you are at, we appreciate your attendance. Uh, my role really here is to kind of set the stage for uh, two things. One, to get to really hear, and this seldom happens, to get to really hear what's going on on the ground. And to also get to hear what value can come out of engaging people on the ground. We have three wonderful people um, who will share their experiences uh, uh, shortly. And essentially what they will be you know, highlighting is, for instance, and, and we talked about the socioeconomic effects, the effects on health service delivery, whether or not differentiated service delivery has been um, improved upon or dumped. Um, and also just looking at the economic effects of all these um, uh, policy pronouncements, and we are probably going to we are we are good we are actually going to hear about you know people having issues with when we lock down transportation, people then even when, even if they wanted and they can afford to go and pick their medicines, they can't because there is no public service uh, transportation available. All the way to you know saying okay we want to be part of the task task shifting and be part of the community health volunteers, but we are being denied uh, um, passes because we are not really uh, in the in the healthcare system, and those are some of the things that are coming out that um, we we would like to you know put out there to say we may need to pay attention to uh, some of those uh, things. Next slide. Um, what is also very interesting is to note that after making so many advances in you know progress in various areas of health, COVID-19 has checked in and kind of threatened to shut down some of these gains. I mean, from uh, continued increased use of uh, voluntary medical meal circumcision to help prevent the spread of HIV. Um, we, we are seeing challenges of even accessing condoms themselves to what is also heartbreaking, the fact that you know it, it took so long to have uh, adolescents and young people finally come into the healthcare system to get help, where we created teen clubs that enable adolescents to be able to kind of uh, vent out and talk about their issues. But because we need to now <laughs> social distance and essentially just shut down that interaction, that comes uh, under threat. And not to, also to just remember that not everybody has disclosed their status in homes or homesteads. And so self-stigma self, self checks in big time. Uh, that uh, also threatens uh, people from adhering to their treatment. Next slide. Um, so this is what people are saying on the ground, loud and clear. You can prevent people from having COVID, but not at the risk of going hungry, not at the risk of malnutrition. You can save people from COVID, but they may end up succumbing to other non-COVID related diseases. And so there's a balance here, and that's what Solange was trying to say, that um, if we get to pay attention to some of these voices, that people who have food, people who have their regular supply of whatever medicines they're having, be it ARVs, TB drugs, or methadone, or et cetera. 
but also to say that you know uh, while we say okay no transportation only vehicles that are transporting uh, goods and services actually goods uh, are, 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 are allowed i think we may need to look into allowing also people who are going to seek medical care um, we are going to hear from Sierra Leone shortly about uh, uh, um, uh, Uganda. Sorry about the uh, uh, that country allowing pregnant women um, moving in and out of health facilities with a pass without uh, restrictions of, and then of course safely. Um, and also to just pay attention to the fact that many countries uh, criminalize sex work and drug use, and that these individuals are also at risk of not getting whatever service they need to get and may need to get some legal uh, aid and lastly i mean in a video that i'm going to show a little later we all assume as we tell people to wash their hands that they actually have access to not just water but clean water and so um something needs to be made clear in there around access to that essential uh, commodity. Next slide. So, so I'm going to introduce Idris from Sierra Leone, um, who is going to share with us some of the things going on on the ground, especially with their experience with Ebola. And this, this would be an interesting thing to listen to because um, it is from past experiences that we get to learn how to manage the future. Over to you, my friend, Idrissa. There's going to be a bit of lag, so um, Idrissa. Why may please uh, unmute Idrissa and let's move. Sorry, thank you very Perfect. much, Amelie. <laughs> Back train. I'm Idrissa from Sierra Leone, from the network of HIV positive in Sierra Leone. Well, now, thank you. Our confirmed cases as of yesterday are 43, and six have recovered, and thankfully we have no death. We have partial lockdown at the moment, and this lockdown will end tomorrow. I mean, on, on Saturday, the 25th and we, the movement is re restricted from one district to the other. And in fact, we have, our borders are closed and we do not um, uh, allow um, uh, flights to come in except for emergencies. And we have curfew. The curfew is from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning every day. And of course, we are, we are under a state of emergency across the country. Uh, and HIV and COVID policy is being developed by the National AIDS Control Program, which is part of the Ministry of Health and Sanitation. And of course, as civil society, we are actually encouraged to um, input into that document. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we, from our experience working with Ebola, we realized that both government, civil society, religious leaders, everybody need to come together, to work together so that we are able to um, uh, end the epidemic or the pandemic. So we are now using that experience to actually work. So we are working with other um, service providers to actually distribute drugs to those that are in need. How do we do it? We call um, the recipient of care that are in need of drugs. And we also ask them to call if they, if, if they are really in need of drugs so that we can take the drugs to them. And we are not working in isolation. We are working together with others. We have hotlines that they can call, numbers that they can call at different districts so that um, their yeah, drugs can be taken to them. We also engage in regular I mean, media uh, discussions. This was an experience we also learned in the, during the Ebola because 
when we are responding to Ebola, it, everything was focused on Ebola. HIV was like put on a put aside. So we had to to go back to the drawing board to say no. If we do not address HIV together with Ebola, when Ebola might have ended, we will have a very serious issue to discuss to, to address. So we are now using that experience to actually engage. So as much as we are responding to, to COVID-19, we are also doing that alongside MM, MM, HIV uh, 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 services. And we also have radio talk shows, we have WhatsApp groups where we engage our members, we actually help them to understand the issues surrounding um, uh, HIV. We also ask, uh, help them to understand the issues around um, uh, COVID-19 because there are lots of misconceptions. So we really wanted to clarify these, these um, uh, misconceptions. And uh, what we are doing that is very much important is that we are, we are engaging in these radio discussions together with NACP, together with members of key populations, so that when questions come that are specific to NACP, they can answer. When questions come that are specific to PLHIV, natives can answer. When questions are asked that are specific to, to key populations, we will have somebody from the key population that will answer. Next slide, please. So, what are, what are some of the impact on uh, COVID-19 on DSD? Well, the positive one has to do with the introduction of the community ART groups. Before this time, it was not functional, but now it is really functional. We started full implementation of the CAG this month, and uh, the, what we are now getting is that amen. Um, Treatment uptake is really, really, has a really, really increased. And among the, we've also been able to reach to those that are really very hard to reach because they are in the community, same community, which we, 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 we are in this, uh, these cars are operating. So we are able to reach them. But for the negative aspect, we are, since we have suspended I mean, support group meetings, so psychology and psychosocial support is really, really I mean, challenging. And also with regards to um, multi-drug, I mean, this uh, multi-month drug dispensing, we, we fear that there could be potential stockout because these are the evidence that we are collecting now from, from, from the community during the, the, the monitoring that we are doing. Because everybody in Sierra Leone now, whether you are stable or not, you, you are supposed to have three months I mean, drugs. And also during lockdowns, people live with HIV actually lack food. And so this will negatively, negatively impact on their ability to actually take the drugs. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. What are some of the recommendations, policy recommendations that we, that, that we are making? Now, the, during lockdowns, government provide a I man aid, especially food aid to vulnerable population, but PLHIVs are left out. So we are, we've started our advocacy to make sure that PLHIVs are also included in the, in the, in, in the aid so that they are able to take their, 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 their medication. Because if we do not do that, that will negatively, negatively impact on, 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 on them taking their drugs. Um, what were some of the lessons that we learned during the Ebola? The lessons was that government, civil society, faith-based organizations, we all need to work together. And so that is what we are now doing. And we are really building on that to make sure that we respond as a team to COVID. In fact, we are having virtual meetings of all HIV service providers. And this is happening on a weekly basis every Thursday. And these meetings are hosted by UNAIDS on behalf of the National AIDS Control Program. It is in all service providers on HIV and AIDS are actually included in that. Next slide, please. This slide, the next slide is actually looking at um, uh, what is done at CAG. These are CAG meeting, the first two on, on my left. And the last one is about is, is about a meeting where natives call other civil society organizations like members of key populations to discuss 
our plan, how we can collectively plan and respond to COVID with regard, with regard giving it an HIV eye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Idrissa. You have essentially highlighted um, a very important thing that human beings just never learn from history and that we need to be reminded that we need to record history and learn from history to avoid making future mistakes. Um, following next is Monsieur Alain from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, Alain is going to share with us in French um, his thoughts and uh, he will be assisted uh, by um, Helen, my colleague. So, bienvenue Alain. Okay, merci beaucoup, Bakrin. Alors, je vais vous présenter la situation euh, de la Côte d'Ivoire en ce qui concerne le COVID. Au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire, les statistiques, nous avons 860 cas, cas confirmés. On a 287 cas guéris et malheureusement, nous avons 10 décès. Et donc, c'est une information qui date du 20 avril 2020. Now, just a moment, s'il vous plaît. Uh, just want to make sure everyone is following. On the left will always be the English. Alain will continue to speak in French. So if you keep your eye on the left side, then you will follow what he's saying in English. If he says anything super exciting that is not written on the slide, Helen will uh, translate for us. Okay. Sorry, Alain. Désolé. Continue. Merci beaucoup, Solange. Alors, comme je disais, Au niveau national, on a un coup-feu, un coup-feu partiel qui va de 5h à 21h et qui a commencé depuis le 29 mars 2020. Alors, il y a ce qu'on appelle l'état d'urgence qui est déclaré au niveau de la Côte d'Ivoire et Abidjan est détaché des autres villes. Ça veut dire qu'on ne peut pas quitter Abidjan pour aller dans une autre zone Et aussi, ce qu'il faut retenir, c'est que certaines, euh, certaines dispositions ont été prises pour définir Abidjan comme grand, grand Abidjan. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a des villes comme euh, Alepé, et Bonois, Bassam, Adiaké, qui ont été prises, et même Assini, qui font partie du grand Abidjan. Donc, en dehors de ces zones-là, on ne peut pas sortir d'Abidjan. Donc, euh, un malade qui se retrouve euh, hors d'Abidjan ne peut pas rentrer actuellement à Abidjan, ainsi de suite. Slide. Diapo. Diapo. Alors, au niveau des politiques, en ce qui concerne le COVID, il faut dire que euh, le programme national de lutte contre le SIDA a élaboré un plan de contingence qui a été partagé avec euh, toutes les parties prenantes, avec les acteurs communautaires, sur les mesures de sécurité pour nous permettre, en tant que communauté, de pouvoir travailler pendant cette situation de crise sanitaire. Diapo. Alors, par rapport à l'implication de la communauté dans la réponse du COVID, il faut dire que le RIP a développé un plan de travail qui a été partagé avec ONU-SIDA, la Fondation d'Idée Droba et même avec UNICEF, juste pour pouvoir renforcer les capacités des acteurs communautaires afin de répondre aux besoins des PVH et leurs familles, notamment dans l'accès aux médicaments antirétroviraux et les informations sur les kits alimentaires. Diapo. Alors, par rapport à l'implication de la communauté tout dans la réponse, il faut dire que le RIP aussi a partagé des informations avec ONU-SIDA par rapport à la situation du COVID. Et aujourd'hui, je suis en train de vous parler, normalement à 14h30, il y a une réunion qui a été convoquée par le ministre de la Santé et de l'hygiène publique qui est prévue à 14h30. Et à cette réunion, la société civile et tous les acteurs communautaires vont partager leurs propositions sur le plan de riposte De, du COVID en Côte d'Ivoire. Diapo. Alors, en ce qui concerne l'impact sur les soins différenciés, ce que je dois rappeler, c'est que aujourd'hui, quand on prend les directives nationales, les patients stables qui doivent normalement bénéficier de six mois de traitement, au jour d'aujourd'hui, on ne leur donne plus six mois, c'est trois mois. Parce que la situation sanitaire fait que le, le, le traitement n'est pas trop disponible dans, dans les pharmacies. Donc, on se contente de donner trois mois au lieu de six mois. Donc, vous voyez que ici, il y a un, il y a un petit changement que la, la, le COVID vient faire dans notre état de santé. Il y a aussi Merci que, euh, il y a, oui, 
Yeah, just to traduce this part here. So just to add that um, because of the current COVID situation, instead of uh, recipients of care getting six months, they've had to reduce the supply that they can get to a maximum of three months. Vous pouvez continuer alors. Alors, aussi, il euh, y a le manque de l'appui psychologique et social pour les PVH qui sont confinés. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, ce qu'on on, on, on ne dit pas, il y a cette euh, psychose de la maladie qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, beaucoup de malades ne vont pas dans les centres de santé. Et donc, toutes ces activités sont arrêtées aujourd'hui. Diapo. Alors, avec euh, le Fonds mondial, il faut dire que le RIP est bénéficiaire du Fonds mondial dans la zone du sud Comoé. Et au jour d'aujourd'hui, toutes les activités se sont momentanément arrêtées à cause de la situation du COVID. Parce qu'on s'est rendu compte que certains communautaires, eux-mêmes souvent, sont vulnérables. Donc, ce ne sera pas intéressant d'aller les exposer à, à cette pandémie de, de la maladie pour ne pas que ces personnes soient encore surinfectées. Il y a aussi que la dispensation des médicaments est réduite parce que le confinement fait que certains patients n'arrivent pas à aller dans les soins pour pouvoir prendre les médicaments. Et aussi, vu que certains centres de santé ne, 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 ne désemplissent pas, la plupart des médecins sont aujourd'hui focalisés sur comment traiter le COVID et les autres maladies sont laissées pour compte. Et ça, il y a un problème. Alors, sur les soins différenciés, ce qu'on a constaté, c'est qu'au niveau des centres de santé, pour le personnel soignant lui-même, il y a un manque de matériel de protection, notamment, je veux parler des gants, des cache-nez, l'alcool. Certains patients, euh, certains personnels de la santé n'ont pas ce, ce matériel-là. Et tout à l'heure, j'ai parlé des centres de santé qui sont peu fréquentés à cause de la situation du COVID. Il y a aussi la limitation pour certains patients à avoir accès aux soins de santé, même pour faire le bilan de suivi, le bilan initial pour renouveler les antirétroviraux. Sans quoi il y a un problème, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de malades qui sont bloqués à Abidjan, qui ne sont pas dans leur centre de santé pour pouvoir faire le, le, le traitement. Diapo. Alors, en termes de recommandations, nous avons dit qu'il était important quand même d'acquérir des kits alimentaires pour soutenir tous les PVIH, où qu'ils se trouvent. On veut aussi acquérir des équipements pour les conseillers communautaires qui font les activités dans la communauté. Ça veut dire quoi Les équipements, il y a les masques, il y a les gels hydroalcooliques, il y a les gants. Et donc, toutes ces mesures-là vont permettre à nos acteurs communautaires de ne pas arrêter les activités malgré la situation du COVID. Et aussi, on veut aussi contribuer au fort de déplacement des patients type IVIH. Ça veut dire qu'un patient qui est dans une zone où il peut aller dans un centre de santé, qui n'a pas les moyens de se déplacer, je pense qu'on peut peut-être à travers des fonds qu'on va mobiliser, aider ces personnes-là à défrayer uniquement leur transport d'un point A à un point B. Diapo. Alors ici, vous voyez euh, le monsieur qui a la, le mégaphone avec euh, le gant. Hein? C'est notre ministre de la Santé, le procès à Kaoulé. C'est le ministre de la Santé de Côte d'Ivoire, qui est dans le marché en train de faire une sensibilisation sur le COVID. Donc, ça veut dire que c'est une affaire de tout le monde. Tout le monde doit s'impliquer. Vous voyez qu'à côté de lui, tout le monde a porté euh, des, des, des cachets pour dire qu'effectivement, la situation est très, 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 très difficile actuellement en Côte d'Ivoire. Diapo. Voilà euh, un centre de santé. Ça, c'est le CHR de Yamsokro, un des grands centres de santé. Aujourd'hui, vous constatez avec moi que ce centre de santé n'est plus fréquenté par les patients, tout simplement parce qu'il y a une psychose du COVID dans la population générale. Alors, le monsieur en jaune, on a aussi constaté que euh, l'État a pris des mesures pour permettre euh, que les marchés euh, soient pulvérisés dans le but vraiment d'aider la population à éradiquer le COVID dans la population générale. Et à droite, euh, les mesures, ont, les, les, les habitudes ont changé. Les gens portent les cachets alors qu'avant, ce n'était pas pareil. On respecte quand même les, les, les mesures d'hygiène pour euh, éradiquer la prévention. Mais en même temps, ce qu'il faut rappeler, c'est que dans la population, ce n'est pas tout le monde qui euh, respecte les, les, les directives et les principes. Voilà, c'est vraiment compliqué. Merci, Merci. beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Alain. Um, Alain makes a very important point uh, during his presentation. 
that uh, while we appreciate the Ministry of Health going out there and creating awareness for behavioral change, it's extremely important to also note that uh, communities of people living with HIV can and are already doing that awareness building, but that it needs to be escalated so that I can tell you for free that people believe people who they trust. And so it, it, it's important for us to also just look at the role of engaging communities in disseminating accurate uh, information. So, merci beaucoup, Allah. Next up uh, is... <clears throat> Bakran, sorry, before we move to Stella, I'm not sure if Helen wanted to say anything about this slide. Just maybe one, I think she had unmuted. Sorry. Yes. Um, no, it's just at the very end, Alain was just using the picture on the right to highlight the fact that there is, like the population is starting to take seriously the threat of COVID, but there is still um, a little bit of resistance from some aspects of some parts of the population. So it's not completely widespread. And that's still a little bit of an issue at this time in Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you. Very yeah, much. And, and yeah, thank you, Helen. And I, I, as I was saying earlier on, some countries, especially in Kenya, have resulted into, uh, while it's criticized, but I, we find the value of it in, in speaking to people in the languages they understand. Not everybody understands English, not everybody understands uh, French, but we, we have a thousand different languages in Africa for which uh, we may need to tap into just communicating these messages in the languages that people understand and can trust. So next up is Stella uh, from Uganda. Uh, Nyabo, you're up next. Thank you so much, Bakhtrin, and the, my colleagues, Elaine and the Drissa, for ex sharing the experiences. So the case of Uganda, Next slide, please. My name is Stella Kentus, the Executive Director of NAFOFANU, umbrella organization that brings together networks of people living with HIV in Uganda. So we have 55 cases. By last night, 38 had recovered and been discharged from the various health facilities. We are in lockdown. Our curfew starts at 7 p.m. and ends at 6.30 a.m. daily. Although we have some few areas where restrictions have been removed. For instance, the cargo cars, those that bring in food have been allowed to move. And from our last presidential, from our last presidential discussion and, and presentation, Pregnant women have at long last been allowed to move without seeking for government permission. We will come deep and we hope that in the process, the vulnerable people living with HIV can also be allowed to move for their fears. I'm also happy to report that the Minister of Health has provided guidance, timely guidance. The AIDS control program has been at it. We were able to get the initial guidelines on HIV and, T HIV and COVID-19. Right now, we have the HIV, TB, COVID-19. But they were also kind enough to develop frequent asked questions, the fact sheets, one that is very specific to people living with HIV, what they need to know and what they have to do. And these are continuously, continuously updated as issues emerge. Regarding our involvement, we've been involved in the development of these guidelines. We have had a number of virtual consultations. And as we talk now, I'm on the group for Minister of Health and the various implementing partners where regular updates are given. And I'm also able to give the perspectives of what people living with HIV are experiencing, what they are going through. So we've come together, indeed, just as we talk about sector response, Uganda has been able to bring on board the various partners, and this has enabled people living with HIV to access their services, including the home deliveries. This is a new thing 
from from since the onset of COVID, and uh, we are hoping that beyond COVID, we'll be able to see some of these nice and best practices continue. Next. So we did a quick, rapid assessment on needs of people living with HIV in the context of COVID together with UNAIDS. This was done late March, early April. It, it was the monkey survey. Because we needed to do a quick one, we reached only 78 people living with HIV. We are in the process of expanding this so that we have a bigger sample size, but also ask specific questions to young people. And the, of these, we had most from the urban areas, although we covered about 22 districts. The, the respondents came from the districts. And quickly to note is that about 60% of the participants had two or more people on air in their households, and the, about 23% had children. These are our silent population, and we need to really be cognizant of these young people, the pediatrics and the children and adolescents. 73% knew that the standard of the usual supply is three months. But then when we asked them if they had a refill of three months, most of the respondents, about 68%, they said they had for one month or less, while only 32% had supply for two or more months. And there was no significant difference between age and, and gender. And the, of the 38% of the 38 parents who attempted to get refills the previous week, only 35% had got partial refill two weeks, one month, and 65% did not get any refill. This was by early April. The situation has since changed with more and more restrictions. We have uh, the, most of the implementing partners have moved into home deliveries. A number of individual people living with HIV, including the expert clients, have been able to support most of the people living with HIV to access their treatment. Next. Next. So we, when, when we, we inquired if there are other services that were needed, especially in line with the TB, condom use and contraception, you can see that for TB treatment, especially those on TPT, about 52% had access to TB treatment, 57% had access to condoms, and 33% had access to contraception out of the number, the, the, the 52, 61, and 51 respondents, respectively. Next. So there are key issues. We had open-ended the questions. So there are issues that we asked you how they were going through this. One of the one of the common common things that cut across the 78, we are looking at lack of transport. In Uganda, the public and private transport is banned. We don't have ambulances that are adequate. So this was a core issue, the long distances to reach the, the facilities. Even if they were there, no more refills, the distances are sometimes distant. They, some have not disclosed. This COVID has showed us that stigma is very real. The number of people who had not disclosed and could not access at the nearby facilities, we are talking of lack of protective gear, especially the masks, but even the sanitizers were unheard of. There was a lot of fear of exposure to COVID. 19, a lot, a lot of fear, but also some people did not have money for other drugs that they needed, especially paracetamol, but also the multivitamins. I also found out that 23% of respondents had children taking ARVs, and the caretakers were finding it a problem to move with their children, to walk on foot, to reach the various facilities where these children were getting their services. And the analysis also indicated that there is a need for TB screening, but also the TB patients must be able to access their treatment so that they do not infect those that they have in the, in the household. And this brings in the vulnerability of people recipients of care versus the, 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 the TB and other 
chronic diseases. And the, from the Kiki discussions we've had virtually, but also on our various WhatsApp groups, one of the things we've noted that some of the community drug distribution points, because they were big, some new ones were formed, and we're hoping this can be, can be retained. Social distancing has to be applied. We have also been able to know that home deliveries have been done. Right now, when I get a call from anybody and says I'm stuck here, a number of implementing partners are willing to deliver. And we're also glad to note that whereas the Ministry of Health has been supportive, this time they have been more responsive, very quick at providing guidance, and this is something we hope will be retained. But on the other side, which is expected, there are no group meetings, which may affect the psychosocial support. We've also had a challenge of stockouts of Atanazava and Pinavin. We are hoping that the Ministry of Health and National Medical Stores are working around the corner to have refills where these sporadic stockouts have been reported. We have issues of hunger and starvation. Now that people are locked up, they cannot do much, so they need food assistance. But there is also limited integration of COVID with other prevailing chronic care. And we would wish to learn from Sierra Leone when they say that most concentration went to, went to Ebola and the other diseases were left out. This is something we would not wish to see happen in Uganda or any other country. Next. So key recommendations, but not all. Right now, the Office of the Prime Minister is distributing food, and our main concern would be people living with HIV who are very vulnerable and cannot afford a meal. We cannot talk of adherence when people have nothing to eat, so our main recommendation is that people living with HIV get considered as a special category of food aid and work within our member networks to be able to identify who is more vulnerable to receive food aid. We also need to think of how do we plan post pandemic phase. We are talking of, of, of HIV, we are talking of COVID, but we've not been able to go deeper to assess, for instance, the impact on viral load access and, the, and, the, and, the, and how will that affect the suppression rates as you get into the 95. But we've also noticed the issues around treatment literacy. When someone who has not been getting from the neighboring, who has not been getting from the usual facility, when there they are no records, they don't carry the teens, and they are asked which drug were you on, or if there is a change of color or shape, we are getting those issues. And that is something that we must be able to consider as part of policy so that it becomes an ongoing and more comprehensive thing that we don't have to wait for a pandemic like this to think of how we can do it and do it better. Otherwise, I thank you for this opportunity and we are hoping that these valuable lessons will help us to plan and program better. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Chun, sorry, <laughs> I'm interrupting you, only because I know you're going to use this session. I want to remind some people, people of some logistical things. Please use the Q&A um, function to write in your questions. Um, that, will, that should happen in the background um, before I hand over to Bactrin to facilitate a bit of discussion. We have two questions that have already been um, put out there. One that they have been put in the chat box, um, a question around recovery. So what does it mean by recovered people? Um, when, you, when you list the statistics, so Alain, um, uh, Idrissa and Stella, when you list the statistics, what does recovered mean in your understanding? And then if you have the policies, please share them, um, the physical policy on HIV and COVID. Okay, over to you, Bactrin, for the discussion for the next uh, 10 minutes. And when you're ready for the next slide, you tell me. Thanks. Thank you, Solange. Uh, thank you, um, Stella, for especially also bringing out the fact that um, evidence-based information sharing can also happen or can be churned out from communities and that you are able to partner with UNAIDS to give us very useful information about what is actually happening on the ground in real time. And we cannot, um, um, uh, you know, 
take that for, for, for granted. And ITPC has also done quite a bit of uh, community treatment monitoring to provide information that then gets to advice policy and programs, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that. I think uh, with the next slide, I would like to just, before we go to discussions, to say that it's extremely important for us um, to just know that when information is taken out there accurately, people on the ground are not dumb. They understand they have the ability to understand some of these things in the simplest way possible and are able to translate what they're being told to save their own lives. I mean, this video of this young uh, boy in the in somewhere in my village gets to demonstrate how it's not impossible to sanitize your hands using technology. This gadget didn't come from one of the developers or pharma or government or no, they just understood what they were being told and they created something so that they can reduce the touching and touching and touching of this and that. So innovation involving community is possible and it's happening. Having said that, uh, I'm going to open um, this session now into uh, discussions to just respond to some of your concerns. Um, before I get to answer some of the questions or uh, panelists get to answer some of the questions, um, Idrissa, is, if there is one thing that you would like, and I'm going to ask Idrissa and Allah and Stella, one thing that they would like to emphasize out of this call, what would that be in 10 seconds? Idrissa will start with you, then we go to Allah, so uh, Helen kindly translate and uh, Stella. So Idrissa, what one thing? Would you like to well, emphasize? The one thing that I really want to emphasize has to do with I mean, collaboration with other partners. Because when we collaborate with other partners, we will be able to actually achieve. So we really wouldn't want to work as, as recipient of care in isolation. But when we collaborate with partners, we will get them around us so that when we take advocacy, they will support us to actually advocate. So our advocacy will reach, the, our voice will be able to reach to those that actually have I mean, the decision-making powers. All right, thank you. And a very quick one on you, uh, which uh, somebody has asked. Uh, Leah is asking, so how do you conduct your talk shows, especially now that there's this social distancing? Could you very briefly in five seconds tell us? Yeah, the talk shows, you have three organizations, I mean, four organizations at a time, but then you are spaced. And you, for us, when you are going to any public, uh, in the, to the public now, you wear your face mask. And we have our, our I mean, we have various organizations, NACP, NETIP, and uh, key populations. We meet, we, we discuss. But before we, yeah. we actually go for the talk show, we, 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 we have discussion virtually on, on, on social media. But so when we go to this I mean, television or, or radio stations, the discussions are really geared towards what we want to, to do to achieve as, as a country together. Wonderful. So when, yeah. for instance, if questions comes to for PLHIV, it's native to answer. If question comes on treatment specifically, NACP will answer. And if question comes for key population, you will have key population that will be able to answer. So that's how we do it. Thank you, Idrissa. Uh, safety, 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 just so that we take out information out there. Uh, Miss Yu Anna, what one thing would you want to just emphasize and tell us uh, that people need to pay attention? Helen? Alors, Alain, just to traduire, um, s'il y avait un message, uh, sur lequel vous voulez vraiment mettre l'emphase et pour communiquer sur ce webinaire, quel serait ce message? Alors, merci Bakrim, merci Hélène. Alors, le message est tout simple. Hein. Il faut euh, qu'on commence à renforcer les capacités des acteurs communautaires 
sur euh, le COVID. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, la dispensation des AEV dans la communauté est une réalité. Et donc, on ne doit pas bloquer les activités communautaires et puis euh, trop, trop se focaliser sur le COVID. Parce qu'à côté du COVID, on a le VIH, on a la tuberculose. Donc, pendant qu'on est en train de traiter le COVID, il faut qu'on prenne les mesures aussi pour traiter aussi les personnes qui sont sous traitement antirétroviral et si procéder aussi à suivre aussi les personnes qui font la tuberculose. Il y a aussi que on doit aussi trouver les moyens pour aider les patients confinés VIH à trouver le nécessaire pour pouvoir suivre, c'est-à-dire les kits alimentaires. C'est vraiment très essentiel. Il faudrait qu'on trouve aussi le moyen d'aider aussi ces personnes qui sont séparées de leur centre de prise en charge à avoir accès aux antirétroviraux. C'est le message okay. que je vous D'accord, merci. So, um, to summarize what uh, Alan was saying was that he thinks it's very crucial that the capacity that we build the capacity of community health agents um, on COVID so that they can take the necessary precautions because the truth is that work needs to continue in communities, um, ARVs need to be distributed. So we just have to equip them with what they need so that they can continue to do their work. Um, and also saying that, yes, it's good that there is a focus on COVID, but we shouldn't focus just exclusively on COVID. We should also pay attention to the fact that their um, PLHIV have uh, other needs. Their um, PLHIV that are also infected with tuberculosis. So they have needs that we need to cater to. And uh, lastly, that is very crucial that uh, we really do all that we can to support all these PLHIV that because of the lockdown are unable to move up and about um, and therefore need uh, assistance in terms of food, uh, whether it's food packages or even just to because they can no longer access their health centers because maybe it's outside of the lockdown area. So we really need to do our best to uh, bring them all the support that we can uh, in terms of food and getting access to the medicines. Thank you, Alain. Thank you, Helen. Um, there, there are many questions head, uh, uh, heading in your direction, Alain, and I think we can answer this. Merci, Bastien. Merci beaucoup. Uh, we can address this offline. Um, so I just want to quickly um, go to, uh, because we have eight minutes, to Stella, that one thing in 30 seconds that you think people need to hear. Yeah, thank you, Bakhtrin. I, I think what comes out very strongly on our side is that stigma is real. Even when the Minister of Health and the other implementing partners have been able to support people living with HIV everywhere, we have a lot of people out there who are not comfortable to come out and say, I need my drugs. We need to do something regarding stigma reduction. Thank you. Wonderful. And there is a question here for you around uh, who supports home delivery of ART? Is it only MOH or are there other partners involved? Stella? Uh, did Stella go? Or Oh, so the Minister of Health has supported through the public health facilities, but we have a lot of partners that are funded by PEPFA that are coming in to do this work. But there are those also who have moved out of their own way to support the, 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 the deliveries like Accord, like the Exist Care Foundation, Uganda Cares, and others that I may not be able to list here because of time. So it is a multi-response kind of approach. Thank you very much, uh, Stella. And I think, so um, just looking at the question and answer chat box, there is quite a bit out there. Um, lots of questions, uh, fewer answers. Um, the, issue, the, the thing here is that we need to ask the right questions to the right people in the right environment to then be and coalesce together to solve these problems uh, together. These things cannot just be sorted out at Ministry of Health desktop kind of top-down 
uh, approach. It's extremely important. If there's anything we need to take out of this uh, webinar is that we need to uh, spread our net as we are trying to solve problems to involve as many parties as possible uh, to be able to achieve the greatest uh, outcomes to have human beings survive from this. Having said that, uh, thank you for the opportunity and I'll hand over back to Solange. Thanks, Matron. Um, we do have five minutes and I think it because, you know, people don't often hear from leaders in the community and if the three of you are leading networks of people living with HIV in your respective countries. I think we can just ask one question, which I think has come up many times. And if you could just quickly answer within the next uh, five minutes, but when people are caught outside of their sort of um, official jurisdiction, the official area or their parent health facility, are, are refills being allowed in the nearest health facility or, or do people struggle to, to, to get medicine if they're not you know, technically registered? Um, Alain, uh, Idrissa and Stella, feel free to unmute yourself and if you'd like to respond. Stella? Yeah, that, thank you so much. We've actually received the guidance from Minister of Health Uganda that uh, people who are not necessary, the, the ones I mentioned as visitors can get at least one month's refill. You go to the neighboring mm. facility and, and get one month's refill. Others have had challenges of stock and some of them have been able to, to, to call or even send a message and then we've been able to link up with other partners that have been able to go in and help. But we still have people who would be able to get from the nearby facilities, but they are still not comfortable to send the border border, these motorcyclists, because they know that their status will be revealed. And that goes back to what I indicated earlier on issues of stigma. But they are getting the treatment. So they, even you. if they are not originally <clears throat> getting from there. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you very much, Stella. And maybe if Adrisa or Alain want to respond, but I also want to, because this is the recipient of care uh, working group um, as part of Sequin, I think it's important for us to answer the question of whether recipients of care were really involved in the formulating of the HIV COVID um, policy. And I know that uh, each one of you kind of touched on that, but if you could also in the next three minutes uh, say what you'd like to say. Uh, you don't all have to speak, but Idrissa, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Can I come in for the answer? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, for Sierra Leone, our situation is similar to Uganda. As long as you have your treatment card, you can go to any facility and you will get drugs. But again, during lockdown, if you are not able to go, you can just call. The, all the numbers are out. You can call and then somebody can take your drugs to you. Thank you. Uh, Alana, I don't know if you want to say anything. It's up to you. I, I think you. I think he's dropped off, actually. I don't see him online. Uh, sometimes the Wi Fi has gone in and out. Okay, well, we can wrap up. Yeah. Sorry, there was a question which has not been answered about recovered. Yes. Yes. For Sierra Leone, we those that we call recovered I mean, patients. These are people who initially tested positive to HIV and they were taken to quarantine center. And after some time, they do their test. If they test negative, the test is also repeated. And if they test negative twice, then they are considered to be recovered, then they can also be sent back home. So that is how we do we do in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Uh, we have like 30 seconds, Patron, so it's going to wrap up. Is there anything you want to say? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I'll yield my time. <laughs> All right. Um, so we will be doing a translation of any questions that have been for a lot, if they were any in French and English. Um, the details of your past, of the past webinars are at this website. Um, and same time next week, Tuesday, uh, for updates from Ministries of Health, uh, will be hosted by ICAP. 
and the resources are here. This recording will also be on the website. We say thank you very much to all of you and we are finished. Thanks everyone.